Hi everyone, this is Brian. I'm one of the tech assistants with the EdCollab gathering today and we're about ready to start uh, workshop number seven. So I am going to pass this off to Heather Rocco who will introduce the panel and get everything going. So Heather, you're up. Thanks, Brian. Hi everybody. I hope you enjoyed that last session. It's been a great day so far. Uh, I'm really excited today um, to lead this panel where we'll talk about discussing creativity. Um, or just designing curriculum um, that inspires creativity. And I am. Hi, everyone. This is Brian. Today, and we're about ready to start okay. uh, workshop number seven. So I'm going to pass this off to Heather Rocco, who will introduce the panel and get everything going. So, Heather, you're up. Thanks, Brian. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that last session. It's been a great day so far. I um, am really having some technical today. problems, so we'll just stop right now for a second. I'll jump in here. I, I think what's happening is somebody's um, audio is on, so it's, oh, okay. it's being recorded. So if everyone can just make sure their, their uh, headphones are plugged in, and okay, because your microphone, I think, is, is picking up the speaker. Gotcha. Hey, nothing like a little tech to... Uh, Keep us going. Okay, so let's get back on track. Is everybody ready? <laughs> um, all right, so thank you. <laughs> we are going to discuss designing curriculum that inspires creativity today, and I am really excited to welcome um, three of my favorite CEL friends. CEL is the Conference on English Leadership. Um, which is the NCTE constituent group for literacy leaders and we're going to talk about ways that we go through the curriculum writing process um, and inspire students and teachers to maintain their creativity even in a time of standardization. So I'm just going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, where they're from, and just say a thought or two about what inspires you. So Scott, start us off. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Egerding, the Director of Curriculum and Instruction from Lyons Township High School in LaGrange, Western Springs. And um, I'm really excited to talk about curriculum because that's what got me into administration, really, was to help more people to become more creative. Great. Emily, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Emily Meixner. I'm the coordinator of the uh, secondary English education program at the College of New Jersey and um, so I work with prospective middle school and high school English teachers and I guess one of the things that um, keeps me creative is just sort of thinking about like all of the possibilities for reading texts and writing texts that I could be using in my classes and my students could be using with their students so, and so it just keeps me searching um, and I'm really excited to be here this morning. We're excited to have you and Chris Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me, Heather. Uh, my name is Chris Bronke. I'm the English Department Chair at Downers Grove North High School, a uh, suburb of Chicago. Um, in that role, I, I have a really cool opportunity to teach one class, but also work with teachers in curriculum. Uh, so I would say the thing or things that inspire me to want to be creative um, are my teachers and my students, um, you know, to, to help them, but also to hopefully inspire them and have them inspire me. So uh, others push me to be creative. Great. And I'm Heather Rocco. I am serving as the facilitator today's um, discussion. And I work in Chatham School District, which is located in New Jersey, um, as the K-12 ELA supervisor. So and I always find creativity from the people with whom I work. Um, they inspire me, just like Chris mentioned, to keep learning and pushing. And um, I also find a little creativity, of course, in poetry every now and then, which is my favorite. All right, so let's get the conversation started. We are going to use a format that's similar to a Twitter chat. So you'll see that there is a question number one, and then we'll have one of our panelists or two of our panelists answer the question. And during that time, we'd love for you to tweet with us using hashtag the EdCollab gathering, hashtag number seven, which is our uh, number session for today. So feel free to jump in on the conversation. Brian's going to be monitoring those tweets. So if you have a question, don't hesitate to pose it. Um, and then Brian will let us know that it is there. So we are going to start with question number one, which is just to share some thoughts on the curriculum writing process. 
who should be involved in that process, how often should it occur, what should the writing and revising process include, um, and any thoughts about just kind of the, how your district works um, with the process. So Scott, I think you were going to start us off with that question. Yeah, I, I really could probably spend a whole hour just on this topic alone. I think the, the most important part of the curriculum writing process is to start with students in mind. And as you look at students and what you want them to get out of a lesson, um, that's got to be where you start. And so um, whether you do it with a partner, by yourself, or as a whole team, or maybe even a summer curriculum rewrite, you've got to really focus on what you want students to get out of it. Because I think more than anything what you get with students is they don't want you to talk at them. They want to get something out of it. And the best curriculum what weaves all the literature and all of the skills you're trying to get into an experience so they can truly have it. And more than anything with that, I think as you look at developing that, you want to make sure that you're doing it frequently, if it's a small unit or uh, something you're doing quickly um, for the next day or the entire, um, the entire, the entire uh, unit. One of the things that we did when I started an American Studies program is we wanted students to feel what it was like to become an American so we wrote curriculum originally to have them go through the Ellis Island experience and learn how to be a citizen and then take that as the frame throughout the semester. And at the end of the semester, then, they had to take their citizenship test. So the whole point of that, the excitement of the, the lessons along the way was, hey, pretend like you don't know this. Then the kids who really don't know it actually can learn it. And those who have absolutely no uh, frame for why they're learning about American history is they could do that kind of thing too. So all in all, I think you want to really um, involve as many people as possible and get a lot of input. Uh, input in particular from uh, coaches if you've got the, the use of them, expert teachers if you, um, or even the teacher right next to you if they're not your favorite expert. Um, you just need a lot of, a lot of support and, and really people to say, well, that's kind of cool. Can I borrow that? And that's, that really builds. Great. Do you have a formal review process in your district, Scott, that you use that every curriculum, for example, is up in, with at a certain time frame? Mm -hmm. or? We do have a um, PLC process, so we are always looking at things um, often aligned to data, but more than anything what we're looking at is um, meeting regularly. Um, we do look at certain curriculum periodically, but we don't have a formal process. I think some of it is just um, teacher driven and a lot of times if things aren't all that uh, exciting or alive anymore if you're changing some books or you're, you're looking at Common Core in a different way then, then you actually have a way to do that. Great. All right, let's move on to um, question number two. And In a world that's kind of governed by standardization, um, how do you ensure that students' creativity is inspired and nurtured by our school's curriculum? So I think Chris and Emily, you're going to um, talk about that question. So Chris, why don't you start us off? Yeah, great. Thanks, Heather. Um, you know, I. I, I love the Common Core State standards, um, and, and and not just. Um, for the reason that I think they are a, a good thing to, to create a, a, a standard across the country um, and to up the level of rigor for our students. But I also think if you, if you read them closely and understand them well, um, they're actually a doorway for creativity as well. Um, and I think that it, it gets a bad rep because of the, the way the media has portrayed little snippets of the actual standards. But when you think about it, you know, some of the things that Common Core has, has done for us is put a renewed emphasis, or at least it should, um, on narrative writing, um, which is something that you know I think traditionally can get overlooked in an English class, um, as well as in other classes. Um, I think that you know it, it promotes more writing across you know the, the curriculum as well. Um, you know it's it's placed an emphasis on uh, more multiple texts within a specific unit of study, um, as well as multiple genre texts. And so for us, you know, in my district, uh, that's been our doorway to get back into teaching more poetry. Um, that we're trying to do more things like that, as opposed to what the, the perception is, is that you know we're doing less of that because of all the nonfiction reading. Um, I also think its renewed emphasis on presentation um, is a great way for us to infuse creativity into our uh, into our students' lives, um, whether it's studying things like or actually giving things like 
TED Talks, for example, um, is a great way for students to, to be creative, to think differently. Um, we like to use the term a lot, and this, again, I think is coming out of the standards because of the multiple multimodal text. Um, how often are we having our kids write in image, right, and thinking about um, images as a way to actually be writers and to tell stories. So uh, for me, I don't think that it's a one or an other kind of thing, and I think as we think about design and curriculum, we need to really examine those standards um, in a way that allows us to see how it can serve as a doorway to creativity, um, not just uh, sort of a, an overemphasis on informational text and an argument. That's great. I was actually just with um, at TC yesterday um, with Lucy Hawkins, and she was talking about how we have gone perhaps too far in the ELA classrooms that the Common Core intention really was about in all subject areas, and that doesn't mean that literature should be pushed out of ELA classes or that we should divide equals 50-50, so it's always reassuring to hear that. Emily, tell us a little bit about um, your thoughts on... Well, I'm not as in love with the Common Core as it sounds like Chris is, but I do think um, I do agree with him in a number of ways, and one of them is that it it really offers us a way to think about the kind of curriculum that we're using really specifically. I mean, really critically, and and I think one of the problems of the Common Core is that it's in some ways um, resulted in teachers and and teacher leaders narrowing the curriculum rather than opening it up. Um, I mean, there are so many materials that we could be using that we're not considering. Um, so I think rethinking the way in which right, we, we select curriculum, um, thinking about the texts that are going to engage our kids, thinking about multiple genres, maybe genres we haven't used in the past before, all of those things are possible with the Common Core, but we have to read them widely. We can't read them narrowly. So um, I mean, one of the things that I like to talk with my own future teachers about is really sort of knowing who their students are and trying to map you know what's dictated by whatever their school curriculum is with their students interests and the students can be involved in developing curriculum too what do they like to read what do they know about right what genres are they drawn to and all of that can can become part of the way in which um, the ELA classroom kind of blossoms as opposed to like I said constricts I have to unmute my microphone for you to hear me. Um, uh, tell me a little bit about um, ways that new teachers, Emily, that you're working with now are entering your classroom and learning um, teaching skills and strategies. Um, what are they coming in with that maybe was even different five or ten years ago since a lot of the students that you see now perhaps lived the beginnings of the Common Core in their own instruction um, in high school? Hmm. I think that they're coming in having used technology differently, um, mm -hmm. although not necessarily as progressively as I might have anticipated. It really kind of varies based on, you know, their school's capacity to provide them with the kind of resources that they need. Um, I think that they're in some ways very savvy about culture and the way in which culture works, but they haven't thought about it in terms of curriculum. And so that's kind of the big turn, trying to figure out how the things that they personally are engaged in can also be used um, as curricular materials as well, and how they might think not just about curriculum in terms of standard kinds of texts that they've encountered in schools, but also like other things that they really like to read and like to watch, right, and like to listen to. How can those things also be mobilized as educational instructional resources? Um, so, so I think part of it isn't necessarily that they're coming in with all of this different stuff, it's just changing their thinking about how they could potentially use it, or talk about it, or or build it. That's great. Chris, I'm just going to go back to you for a minute. As you are hiring teachers um, to fulfill ELA room, uh, classrooms and roles, um, what are some of the things that you're noticing that they're bringing with them um, in terms of a skill set with being creative that um, maybe they didn't have before? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and I think um, one of the biggest things, I'm seeing uh, younger teachers um, more willing to take really great risks in the classroom, um, and I think sometimes creativity in and of itself is a risk, right? You know, as creative producers, we're taking risks constantly, and I think the teachers themselves 
um, are doing that within the lessons they're creating and their approaches um, because there's you know kind of like what Emily was saying with the technology out there you know whether they're really you know academically adept with using it or not they still get it and they still understand um, all of the multiple modes of learning that that lessons can now have and, and I think they're willing to take those risks to uh, incorporate those sorts of things and to let students um, go find those sorts of things that then inspire them and uh, it's been really cool to see and, and, I, and I hope that 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 trend continues. Great, thank you. All right, let's move on to our third question, which is, how do we give students ownership of their learning and encourage them to be creative? Um, what are some of the tools or strategies that you've seen teachers utilize um, that promote this kind of creative thinking um, and really empowering the students to use their learning in creative ways? So, um, Scott, why don't you start us off? All right. You know, I think one of the most important shifts that's happened, especially recently, is that sage on the stage, the teacher who's up there telling everybody about how a book is supposed to be interpreted, has really shifted. And that, if anything, is how you give that ownership back to the students. Um, I found some real success when the teacher is quiet and has given students not only roles or perhaps scaffolding of some kind so they can enter a text in a certain way. And then when they have cooperative, good cooperative learning structures, they can talk with their peers, they can um, reason out some things, think about some, some deeper problems, and giving them the time, really, to do that. It's not a quick thing, um, but I think it really gets them into that creativity angle. Um, the more that you can have a student really grapple with a text, say even um, Walden, um, when they're really thinking about and reading, it takes a while, and you've got you've to think, and you've got to really play. Um, but more than anything, that's an experiential book. You're supposed to be out in the woods. And so how do you get kids to bring the woods into the, into the classroom? Well, you give them time, and you get them to think about it, and you get them to figure out how to use all the senses, and you can't just lecture on it. So more than anything, I think that's how you give that ownership. It's the time. It's the structures. Um, and connect with what the text is really all about. Thanks. Emily, what are some of your thoughts on that? Um, well, I love what Scott had to say about cooperative learning opportunities, and I also loved um, what he had to say about time, because deep thinking and commitment takes time. Um, to, I would add to that inquiry, and I think that this is one of the things that you're seeing in really creative classrooms, uh, regardless of, you know, level college or K through 12, um, teachers who are engaged in authentic inquiry projects with kids, you know, where kids are getting opportunities to ask questions about the world in which they live or they're asking questions about the books that they're reading um, and those questions are really coming from them and then they're learning how to use resources and their peers um, to help them answer those questions. Those are the places where I see um, in some ways the most creative learning happening and the most um, responsible but also generative um, and it's meaningful for kids because they're they're invested in every part of it. It doesn't feel like it's something that they're just doing because they have to do it. It's something that they're doing because they want to do it. Um, so so to, to Scott's list, I would add inquiry, absolutely. That is great. Um, and I love how we are transitioning from students producing work for the teacher and producing work for the world, that they are, you know, generative, that they're creating projects. Um, or just blogs or whatever that's out there in the world that they're contributing to the conversation. Does anybody have any examples of that that they could talk about in a little more specifics about things that um, you've seen students do? I could just follow up on the, uh, the Thoreau example. Um, when I had my students reading Walden, um, after the first two or three chapters, the students kind of understand the, the philosophy. Um, the worst thing you can do is then read the rest of the book. I mean, it, it takes a long time, and there's, there's um, perhaps time-wise not as much to get out of it. But what I did is I paired students up, and they each took the next chapter. So The Pond in Winter, which is one of my favorite chapters, two kids took it, and then they just, they had, we had a thorough fair, and they had four days to put together their stuff, and they, they had a fair. They had to get kids to experience your chapter, having never read it. So... I think that's one of those things where, you know, I had kids doing bozo buckets. We had kids who were um, trying to figure out how to get kid, people to, to pet certain things and feel what they felt like. Um, we had one kid bring in a fish so you could touch it. All that sort of stuff they wouldn't have done otherwise, and they understood Walden. 
as opposed to reading the whole thing. Yeah, and I, I have some similar examples, but at the college level, I used to um, do uh, what, what I called a burning questions project with some of my method students, and basically I said to them, what's your question? You know, what, what, are, what are you not getting? What do you really want to know going into your first couple of years of teaching? And um, I would be astonished by the things that they would come up with. One student would do a, a project in which he or she would really immerse themselves in grammar, debates over grammar instruction. Someone else would do a project on the availability of gay and lesbian literature and how people use that in their curriculum. Some people would want to look, look at classroom management. Um, I had one student once who um, put together a huge, beautiful website with um, suicide prevention resources on it. So I think, you know, if the students are asking the questions and they're really, I think, given time, to think about them and, and, and given access to resources and shown how to use them, they can do really, really amazing work. Yeah, that's great. And it leads really nicely actually into our next question. Um, and part of this, when we talk about assessment, I'm also going to ask for um, you to tell us a little bit about the evaluation of the assessment too. So, so often when we give students create creativity or creative options um, for assessment, then I, we hear back from teachers, well, how can we be sure that we're evaluating them fairly? So question four asks, what are some of the more creative assessments you've seen teachers utilize in their teaching? So if we could um, speak to that, we'll go to Chris first, but then Chris, also as you're talking, tell us a little bit about the evaluation and how do teachers manage that with students and then explaining it to parents even as well. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, I think with the evaluation part, I mean, it, it like with any assignment, creative or not, it, you know, it comes down to making sure that you're only assessing the components that are part of the learning goals. Um, you know, it, if, if it's aligned to your learning goals, then it should be easily accessible, even if it is creative. Um, some of the examples that, you know, uh, that I've seen, um, I think the best one recently is one of our uh, AP Lit teachers has really been focusing on instruction of poetry and how to do that better. Um, you know, he's just been struggling with it. His students are always struggling with it, especially at that AP level, because so many of those students come into, into that class thinking they're really skilled readers, um, and the second that they're met with that sort of poetry, they just shut down, right? Um, it's the first time they've, they've been a struggling reader maybe in their whole life. Um, so what he did is he embraced that. Um, he has an advantage to some extent in that he is uh, also our TV and radio producer and his or, uh, teacher and his class is in the studio so he can do stuff with film pretty easily. Um, but he actually put his students into pairs and gave them each a poem that they had never seen before and no prep time. And they had to go on, you know, in front of the green screen and get filmed uh, reading this poem cold, aloud, uh, and then discussing it. Just first impressions, what are we thinking, what, what are we noticing, um, and just kind of talk about a poem like they would. And then they got two weeks to go do research on the poem, uh, on the poet, on other poems by that poet, or connected poets, all the, you know, the time period, all of those things. And then they came back and recorded themselves again, now talking about the poem. Um, so it was a really cool, you know, in, in that point, you know, what he had to do is ask himself, like, what's the learning goal, right? Like, the learning goal necessarily wasn't the, the presentation. So that, you know, from an assessment standpoint, it was, it was about the poetry, about the analysis. Um, but he could glean the same things he would have gleaned from a paper, uh, but letting them, you know, converse and talk and, and do what we really should be doing with poetry, and that's talking about it and experiencing it. Um, and it was such a cool project uh, that he actually ended up asking uh, staff members to then do the same thing. So that then in future years, he could show his classes that everyone struggles with poetry. Like that's part of the, the beauty of it is that, that, uh, that wonderful frustration. Um, and so, you know, myself and, and another teacher have been filmed doing some and um, other, other pairs as well. And so it was, it was a really cool opportunity, I think, to make students and, and uh, teachers appear to be equal uh, and, and appear to embrace that struggle together. Uh, and then also, you know, uh, be a, a sound way to do assessing all of the skills that those kids are going to need for the AP test. That's great. I had the opportunity actually of seeing one of those videos um, that Joanna Schwartz, uh, our CEL colleague as well, mm -hmm. created. I think she was with Mark, I think she did Mark Strand, I think was the poet. Um, yeah. yeah, and that was fantastic. He's one of my favorites. But All of the poems that he selected for the teachers were all Mark Strand poems mm -hmm. uh, because they kind of forced us to struggle pretty, uh, you know, early on if we had never seen the poem before. You know, I, I, we did, uh, I had been a polar explorer and I just finished it and reading it aloud on the film and I said, Huh. You know, and he, he still uses that one in class because we just had no clue what was going on. That's great. 
Um, Scott, do you want to offer um, any input there on um, that question? Yeah, I think um, one of the better ones that I've seen, we have an interpersonal communication class, speech class for a better, uh, better word. Um, and one of the things they really want to do is focus on the oral and oral quality of language. And so um, they had students do a similar thing. They had to go pick some poetry um, or a passage, um, and, and they've even allowed some plays. And then they had to do it. They had to perform it. They had to figure out how to perform it. So in, in performing it, you have to try and figure out what the choices were that the author made, why they made those choices, how do you use vocal inflection. If it is a poem, do you read through the line breaks or not? Um, is there a cadence or a rhythm to it, and are you going to stick to it? Um, and it had all sort of built up into a, a competition, and so the, the students had the opportunity to move forward in a competition against other classes. Um, and then ultimately, if you're familiar with uh, Poetry Out Loud, um, they got a chance to compete to perform for Poetry Out Loud. And every year we usually get one, one group that kind of gets through it into that competition phase. The point not necessarily being the competition, although that is the point for a lot of high school kids, um, it's that they're making deliberate choices about language, which you wouldn't do if you're reading it to fill out a worksheet or uh, make sure you can read, compare, and contrast two poems. They're really delving deep. And the way that works with grading is you've got to have really clear expectations. You've got to have some um, some ways that students know if they're on the right track or not. Um, and it really helps to have rubrics, because the rubrics sort of give you the language that you need in order to focus on the right thing. So all in all, it, it's super su successful, even for the kid that doesn't get picked, to go to the, the Chicago Area Poetry Out Loud competition. And all in all, it becomes a really great opportunity for kids to perform and show off with poetry, which um, those are just great days to go and watch them do. Can I um can I just jump in here and, and make a comment? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I was thinking um you know about the examples that Scott and, and Chris both provided, and I was thinking about assessment in general. And one of the things I think about creative assessment that's difficult is that you can't, as a teacher, always dictate the terms of your students' learning. Like you just I mean even if you're using a rubric, you're going to see something in that project or something in that performance, and you're going to think oh yeah, that's what I wanted, but it's not on the rubric, right? <laughs> and there's no, there's, and so in some ways, um, I think the rubrics are helpful as guidelines, but, but one of the things that I've, I've loved when, when my students um, have done this is when they've created rubrics that, um, that students can contribute to so that the students can identify what it is in the project that's become really meaningful to them um, throughout the process of doing it. And so that becomes part of the assessment as well. And so if we can give kids some ownership over that assessment, and they can, in some ways, tell us what was the most important thing that you did or you learned or that came out of this project, I think the assessment will be much more effective. Oh, that's, thanks for adding that, Emily. That's great. We do have to make students aware of what they're learning, not only tell them, of course, what they're learning. There are things that um, come up that we never even expected. So thank you. In... Um, our education discussions today, of course, we talk about STEM often, too much. Um, but that's just my own a little opinion there. Um, but there is a need for us to really think about how can we encourage students to be innovators in our class because we do have students in our room who are interested in that um, kind of work. So with that in mind, our next question, number five, is how do we offer students the opportunities to be innovators in ELA classes um, as well as their science classes or their text classes? What are ways that we allow them to innovate and explore um, their own ideas? So I think we'll start then with Chris. Great, thank you. Uh, you know, I've got a couple of thoughts on this, and it's something that I've been wrestling with for a couple of years, uh, and even more so this year, um, as I've done a lot of work in the department um, using design thinking uh, to, uh, to solve problems and to create lessons so that we're really grounding our experiences uh, in our students' needs and looking at our students as more than just um, reading data points, uh, but actual people with interests and, and desires and those sorts of things. And it's been, it's been pretty cool. Um, you know, I think one that I've seen that is, you know, not by any means, you know, revolutionary in terms of where it's at in society or in the educational society today, but is, you know, using Genius Hour um, and allowing that, that freedom. Um, I know I've gotten some pushback when I've talked with teachers about that. It's like, oh, I don't have the time to do that, or, you know, that, that just really works well in the elementary school grades. Um, one of our AP Lit teachers right now actually uses it consistently. Um, 
and she ties it to some of the course goals uh, about research and, and, and reading and thinking, but uh, she uh, herself, as you were talking about, Heather, with the STEM thing, over the last couple of years has noticed an unbelievable increase in STEM-minded students taking AP Lit. Um, and, and she she knew she had a chance, uh, or, or she had a choice, I should say, of you know continuing to plug through just in a very traditional AP lit sort of way, um, or you know connecting to their lives, or allowing them to connect to the curriculum in ways that made sense for them. And so she's used, uh, you know, the the Genius Hour concept is something that allows them to. But I think more than anything for me, and, and what I'm working to do in my own classroom is, is you know innovation comes when the teacher gets out of the way. Um, you know, about a year and a half ago, I stopped assigning writing prompts uh, to any piece that we do because I want kids to write about books, not about prompts. Um, and I think little moves like that, uh, anytime we can get ourselves out of the way and allow students to, uh, using the skills that we've taught, express their learning in ways that make sense for them, um, and about topics that are interesting to them, uh, I think everyone wins. I love what you're saying there, too. Well, writing about the book, not the prompt, but also that it's a matter of demonstrating the skill. It's not always about, you know, everyone has to write an essay. Maybe some students want to write a blog post or produce a video, as long as they're hitting on the skills that you've been, you know, clearly delineated um, that they need to practice and learn. That allows them to be creative as well. So thanks, Chris. Scott, did you want to join in there? Yeah, I think another way you can do it is offering student choice. I mean, there's no way that I could possibly understand the depth and breadth of the reading that my students have done. And so I, I need to be connected to book lists and to help kids find the books that would be interesting to them. So if it's a STEM-related book, there's a lot of great nonfiction books, um, you know, Driving Around with Einstein's Brain or any of those kinds of things that really get, um, get kids connected to things they like and then you can sort of sneak in all that, you know, English stuff in there. You could get them to better understand how to read for detail. You can work more on research um, if they're reading something they like to do. Um, we had a partnership set up with one of our chemistry teachers. Every summer he has the kids read a book during the summer chemistry class. Perfect, because it connects the kids to science and to literacy. So I think a lot of it is partnering with other, other teachers, seeing who's doing what in the school at the time, and finding out what they like to read. Believe it or not, teachers read books that aren't English teachers and they have a good list of things that they really enjoy to read. And When we did our summer reading uh, program a couple years ago, we went to the content area teachers and said, hey, what are the things that you're reading that you like to read? We got great books, you know, The Art of Running in the Rain and those types of things that, oh, well, there you go. You know, of course, you're reading too and it connects to your particular, to your particular discipline. That's great, and anything that we can do to promote the fact that other teachers read, um, I think, is always worthwhile. And you show students that you know science teachers are reading science texts because they love their you know uh, their subject area, and they might be interested in it too. It's great. It actually leads really nicely into our next question, so I appreciate that, Scott. Your segues are wonderful. Um, so <laughs> we are going to talk about now what texts have you introduced into curriculum. To recently to promote creative and innovative thinking. What are some of the things that you've added to classrooms um, conversations and kind of if you talk a little bit about what grade level you've added them to that would probably be helpful. So um, Emily, uh, who I always love, Emily is so wonderful about sharing the young adult <laughs> literature in particular <laughs> that she reads. I, read, I, try, I follow her on Goodread and try and read everything that she uh, recommends. So One of the things um, that I'm currently obsessed with as a text um, is Encyclopedia of an Ordinary Life. Have any of you read that? No? Um, so what the author does is that she recreates or she tells and she narrates the story of her life but through all of these really it's like quirky, interesting, funny, poignant um, encyclopedia entries that oftentimes include artifacts. So you'll see letters that she might have sent to a sibling or something that she sent to a grandparent or something that she received. Um, she uses timelines. She uses receipts. It's just, it's like this fascinating book. And so um, Kelly Gallagher talks about it in one of his chapters in, in Write Like This. And I think that that's where I originally met the book. Um, but I like to use it to give um, my students a way of thinking about narrative possibility. I think oftentimes they're really in the habit of thinking about like the personal narrative or even the memoir. But there are so many ways that you could actually write in terms of a narrative that just showing them that book really opens up 
you know, what they can then imagine because they can see it. It's so different right in front of them, but that's one of my favorites. Um, the other text that I was thinking about is a, um, a children's compilation of all these different kinds of poems, and it's a narrative called Gone Fishing. Um, I found it at a bookstore and immediately brought it home because I thought, you know, it just sort of screamed mentor text. But it's this beautiful story of this boy who wants to go fishing with his dad and his sister wants to come along and he's not particularly happy about it. But the whole narrative, which is really sweet, is told in all of these different kinds of poems and they're all identified by the author. So if you're looking for, again, multiple ways or in a way that you could um, put a series of poems together in terms of a narrative, I think it's a great example. That's wonderful. Thanks for the recommendations. I'm adding to my list as I, <laughs> as I yeah, go. Yeah, Ghost Fishing is, is sweet. You know, I was reading it to my son, and um, who's nine, and you know, I was getting all choked up, and he, of course, is like, "Are you crying?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I kind of, kind of am." But yeah. it's it's so it's such a wonderful example of how you know how you can use poetry to tell stories. That's great. I know. I just when I met with um, teachers at the beginning of the school year, we. Um, talked through How to Read a Story, which is a new picture book by Kate Messner. Um, and it really is about, yeah, it's a really about, you know, this is step number one. You find mm -hmm. a cozy corner, and it teaches kids, you know, how to go through the reading process. But mm -hmm. two, kind of changes the narrative structure from just telling a story to these are the directions. It's very manual-like in its writing with these beautiful, lovely pictures as well. So um, that's yeah. great. So thanks for the recommendation. Um, Scott, any text that you'd recommend or have added recently to your curriculum to promote creativity? Uh, our English teachers are a little nervous about recommending text because we have a district policy you have to keep a book for five years. But um, one of the reasons why I kind of like that rule is because then they're encouraged more to experiment and do more student choice books um, rather than one book that everyone has to read so we don't get the grapes of wrath for everyone for a month. Um, but one of the things that I've, I've always found really useful is using children's books in the high school. Um, whenever you can bring a kid's book into the high school, and you, you let it, try this sometime, have all your students sit on the floor, turn out the lights, and read a children's book to them in high school, it is the coolest thing. They're so wrapped with attention, they're sitting crisscross applesauce, and they want to read all about Henry David Thoreau or whoever your book is, and it gives you the background. It's a great pre-reading activity. Um, and it's a, it's just a lot of fun. So you know, any any children's book, I know I would be reading books to my own kids at home. I'm like, I had to bring this into my students. I even did it for uh, an English department meeting. I read a children's book um, so that everyone could see, you know, what what we're all about, about the fun of learning. That um reminds me, there's a book by Peter Brown, a picture book called You Will Be My Friend that I like to read at the beginning um, of the young adult lit class that I teach. And the college students really identify it with it because in some ways it's kind of like being a freshman in college, yeah. right? Like, are you going to be my friend? You will be my friend. So I think that's a great idea, Scott. People don't remember how wonderful picture books are, and there are so many great ones out there now. So to you know, use those at a variety of ages is such a, such a great suggestion. Absolutely, and I love, I've shared, done read-alouds, whether it's with picture books or just read-alouds, and we forget that power that being read to has over you until you look out into a sea of 25 faces that are all, you know, ranging in age from 15 to 18, and they're just engaged with you and watching mm -hmm. you as if they were still in second grade. We enjoy the storytelling experience, and it's something that we often let go of as kids get older, and, and we shouldn't, so thanks for that. All right. Speaking of reading, um, so are there any professional resources or professional texts that you would recommend to help those who are watching today or going to watch our archive later continue thinking and pursuing this idea of allowing for more creativity in um, their curriculum? So uh, Chris, can you start us off with that one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are two texts that I read this summer, um, in part because uh, we're talking about summer reading a little bit earlier. We're working towards going to a one book, one school read for this upcoming summer. And so uh, it was kind of fun this summer to read a lot of very different types of text uh, to try and help us figure that out. But um, one that I read that was part of the, the selection process we're looking at is um, Steal Like an Artist. Um, by, I believe I just brought it up, it's uh, Austin Cleon is the name. Uh, fantastic book about basically the idea that creativity is not 
it's not Mozart just sitting there and like writing a symphony in one draft or like you know it's it's the idea that we steal things and we and we remix things we mash things up and we and somehow then in, in that process it becomes our own our own product and uh, really a really cool book that I think you know when we show it whether it's to teachers or to students um, I think it empowers individuals to realize that we all have creative capabilities within ourselves as opposed to the well I'm not a creative guy or I'm not a creative person. Um, and then he also has a second book called Show Your Work, which kind of follows up on that. Um, and they're both pretty short and, and really just to the point and practical examples. And um, they've, they've absolutely changed uh, the way I approach my thinking in education and in life. Um, I see myself as a more creative person now, uh, which I didn't tend to always do. So I would highly recommend both of those texts. Great. Thanks for those recommendations. Chris, you made me think about, too, that word creative, and perhaps we should have started the conversation with this um, idea, but it doesn't only mean that you're a dancer and an artist or, you know, there are lots of ways to be creative, and it made me think about Jim Mahoney, um, who Emily knows from TCNJ, uh, who's also a CEO member, but I remember him pushing hard uh, about when we were calling creative writing you know, fictional writing or poetry. He said all writing is creative. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter the type of writing or the genre that it um, is written in. Analytical writing can be creative. We we have to promote that um, idea throughout. So I love that. Um, so thanks to Jim Mahoney because it is. I think about that all the time. Um, and Scott, any text that you'd recommend for people who wanted to continue pursuing this idea? How about this one? Um, Mihai, I can never pronounce his name, Shiksenk Mihai, um, his, his book on creativity. Um, he interviews hundreds of creative folks on what it means to be creative and how they're creative and really looks at the whole concept. Um, it's, a, it's a really fun read, um, and it also gives you um, insight into just how fluid the whole creative process is. Great, thank you. All right, Emily's going to take our last question um, for today, and then if there's any questions that have come up from um, Twitter, then we can um, take those as well. But the Conference on English Leadership, CEL, of which we're all members, does really focus on supporting teacher leaders, literacy coaches, and supervisors. Um, so it is important for us to really think about how do we model this for the teachers with whom we work. So, Emily, how can creativity be modeled by teacher leaders and school leaders? Have you seen anyone or done something yourself that shows um, doing that just, well? I mean, just being explicit about and talking about our processes as teachers, um, as teacher educators, I think is really important. I'm, my students will often come um, into my office, and there's so many books in there, and, and I have to say to them, you know, I, I've collected these over a lifetime. I'm constantly seeking out new resources. And so when I find them, I'll bring them to class and say, this is where I found this, or this is where I found this, or this is the idea that I stole today from this particular resource. And here are all the places that I go to inspire me at different times. If I'm looking for something interdisciplinary, I go here. Or you know, if I'm looking for the names of an author, I go here. And so I think just being really, really explicit about our sources um, and being excited about them and making them public can be really beneficial, both to kids, right, but also to, to, to our colleagues and future teachers, too. That's great. Um, I know for our, in my department, too, we talked about Genius Hour earlier today, so I think in order to get teachers comfortable with doing that, perhaps in their classrooms in the future, we've made that part of our goal this year as a department. Um, so teachers are setting a personal goal for themselves, and then we're using some PD time that we have to allow them to explore that goal. So we're calling it Genius Hour, and they do it over the course of the year. They have um, certain Monday afternoons where they're given time to do that kind of work. And then at the end of the year, hopefully, we'll all bring our ideas back together and everyone can share what they've learned. So I think it's important to give teachers that experience that the, we would love for them to introduce um, into the classroom first because then they can view it from a student perspective before even per, um, looking at it from an educator perspective too. And that sharing I think is so important, right? I mean you need you need an audience like any any other like curricular piece of work. You need a real audience and if people are going to take the things that you found and make use of them, that's really um, really inspiring I think in some ways to be creative and to constantly go out and seek for other sources that you could use. Absolutely. 
Well, we are almost running out of time. We are at 12.44 right now. So I want to thank Scott and Chris and Emily for joining us today for the conversation on designing curriculum that inspires creativity. I hope that everyone watching here today found some inspiration and something to pursue. Um, just a couple things to end with here. To live a creative life, we must lose our fear of being wrong. Um, and sometimes we perhaps are afraid to take risks in curriculum because we're are nervous that we'll pick the wrong text or the wrong assignment or the wrong assessment or the wrong evaluation, but that um, we just have to jump in sometimes and see what happens. So um, I thank you for your time Oops, excuse me, today. And we just wanted to say as we close out, don't forget to donate um, to Book Love Foundation, um, which is Penny Kittle's um, foundation. She donates to the Classroom Library. They are our um, charity for today. And we hope that you have a wonderful school year and continue following um, other sessions for the rest of the day. So thanks so much, Scott, Chris, Emily. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have a good day. <laughs>